K-band is a big deal in the satellite industry right now. Uh, there's lots of KA band activity going on. Uh, some of the KA band activity is related to video. For instance, actually DirecTV in, in the U.S. is the currently, at the moment, the largest operator of uh, KA band uh, payload. But they're using that for TV, for broadcasting into small areas. But where the real excitement is with KA band is with data. Um, as you can see, there's a number of KA satellites that are already up in place. Uh, Wild Blue, which is operated by Viasat, Spaceway, which is operated by Hughes, Eutelsat has a KA sat satellite that they call KA Sat, uh, and Viasat and Hughes just launched their uh, second satellites. That's a lot of capacity that's being brought to the market uh, that's going to be used for data, specifically for, for internet. And what we're seeing is that the use of KA band uh, for the satellite system is really enabling a new generation of uh, satellites that are really purpose designed for two-way data, specifically for, for internet access. Uh, these satellites have been um, optimized for data for internet, and that, that means is that we get the lowest possible cost per bit. But we don't have to have the satellites completely dedicated to KA. It could be also partial uh, payload. And that's what some of these some of these other satellites, for instance, uh, this Hispasat satellite from uh, um, Spain, the Amazonas 2 satellite, that's a partial payload. So we're seeing a lot of activity with KA band, a lot of it focused on, on data. And I'm going to just touch on why this is happening and, and what the benefits are to the industry. So why KA band? KA band is just a frequency. But um, really what we're talking about is a new generation of satellites that have a lot of capacity and are optimized for data. And really what's driving it are the, the key drivers of the, the service business. And, and the key here is being able to get as many subscribers as possible, and we're talking internet access, uh, getting as many subscribers as possible on the satellite and being able to provide them the throughput performance, the capacity that these subscribers want. We see that with the growth of the internet, with so much uh, access to things like YouTube and file sharing and there's just a ever increasing a volume of data that subscribers, internet users are, uh, are consuming. So KA band is an enabler to get more satellite capacity uh, and get that capacity at a lower cost per bit. KA band is just convenient because there's actually orbital slots that we can get and there are characteristics of KA band that I'll talk about shortly that make it economical to build these satellites that have a lot of capacity. At the same time, there are some issues with KA band. Uh, most notably that there's rain fade, and then there's also the issue of uh, the beams. These are uh, multi-beam systems with frequency reuse. You have to be very careful about how you design these systems because you don't have the ability to go back and, and change in a few years uh, where the beams are located. One of the things that make KA band attractive is the simple fact that there are actually orbital slots available. This is a depiction of the orbital arc around the Earth. We're, we're talking geosynchronous satellites. And the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, and other regulatory bodies control exactly where satellites can be placed. And satellites are placed in something that's known as an orbital slot. With KU band, uh, there's a two degree spacing between orbital slots in the uh, orbital arc. And virtually every orbital slot for KU band is, is occupied. KA band, that's not the case. There are orbital slots that are unoccupied. There may be filings for them, but they're unused and so it's possible to get an orbital slot by a satellite operator 
for the purpose of putting in Ka. For, for Ku and for C-band, those orbital slots simply don't exist. So this is one of the drivers for uh, new Ka-band satellites. I, I keep on talking about Ka-band. Ka-band itself is just a frequency. Um, so really I'm just, I'm using Ka band, the phrase Ka band is, is kind of a, a catchphrase for uh, what some people call high throughput satellites or high capacity satellites. But let me talk first about Ka band. In the satellite industry, uh, as you can see, there, there's a number of bands that are used, starting at L band, S band, which I, which I don't show here. These are those are very low frequency bands, relatively speaking, as far as satellite goes. Those are around the 1.5, 2 gigahertz. But when it comes to uh, VSAT networking, very small aperture terminals, generally start at C band, which is in the 4 to 6 gigahertz range, to KU band, which is in the 10 to 12 gigahertz range. And when we talk about KA, we're talking about systems that operate in the 20 to 30 gigahertz range. So it's a higher frequency. This has some interesting attributes to it. The first is that uh, with the higher frequency, the uh, focus of the antenna um, is more uh, precise. So what this means is um, we, we get more gain out of the antenna, but we have to very carefully uh, point that antenna. Um, the more gain means that we can use generally a smaller antenna um, but it has to be very carefully aligned. Um, and so that speaks to the, the size of the antenna. Uh, and then another factor is rain fade. And this is probably one of the first things that people can think about and are concerned about when it comes to Ka band. If you look at um, rain fade, which is really the attenuation of the radio signal due to uh, atmospheric moisture, uh, if you look at the lower frequencies, C-band, rain is not a big impact on the radio signal going through the atmosphere. As we go up to KU-band, rain becomes an issue. As we go to higher frequencies, KA, and even if we go to V-band, which is a, a band I think we'll see in the future, for particularly for feeder links, in those bands, rain becomes a significant issue. So uh, we have to do things to mitigate or overcome the rain fade. Uh, and so the industry has developed a range or set of rain fade mitigation techniques, which means that even though rain fade is an issue with Ka band, we can still overcome uh, the rain fade issues. And I'll talk about that shortly. One of the attractive things about Ka band is the fact that because it's a very high frequency, the components, the things like waveguides and amplifiers, the components that go into the satellite and that comprise the payload that sits on the satellite bus, these components are smaller than you find in C-band or, or KU-band. And what, that's, what this means is that we can pack onto the satellite payload more beams, if you will, uh, than we could with uh, C-band or KU-band. So the byproduct of a very high frequency has a benefit of us being able to pack on more capacity onto uh, the satellite payload. And that translates into more bits per satellite. And because the cost of the satellite is relatively fixed, that means we get a lower cost per bit. With the Ka band frequencies, rain fade is an issue. And so the industry has developed uh, a fairly extensive set of techniques to overcome rain fade. On the, the forward channel, and that's the channel from a gateway station to a user beam, the techniques include uh, things like adaptive coding and modulation on the forward channel. So this is where uh, dynamically that forward channel can be modified with regards to the modulation scheme, say 
QPSK to 16 APSK or 32 APSK and in combination with the coating rate, one half, four fifths, eight ninths, and this gives us the ability to get a significant range of, um, of rain fade. It could be as much as uh, 18 dB of rain fade that could be gained by just playing with a combination of modulation and coding. Now that, that's really something that we want to do between the satellite and the user terminal. Between the gateway and the satellite, we rely on well-proven techniques such as having uplink power control that's tuned to a beacon receiver uh, or a beacon that's received at the gateway station. Um, and of course, having larger antennas at the gateway helps with gain. And we can also have what's called RF diversity for the gateway stations. This is where uh, we have a, a physical separation of 30, 40 kilometers between the RF of the gateway station because rain fades are very local events. When it rains really hard enough to interfere with the satellite transmission, um, that's going to be a very local event. And uh, studies have demonstrated that if you can go just 20, 30 kilometers away, that rain fade event isn't happening. On the return channel, that's the, the channel from a user terminal back into the gateway, uh, we, we have a set of techniques that involves, once again, adaptive coding uh, of the FEC rate. We can change the symbol rate. If it's a system that has uh, multiple uh, modulation techniques, we can also change that. So we can dynamically change the modulation and coding of the return channel as well. We also have the ability to have uplink power control. And in areas where it's just heavy rain, we can always use larger antennas. In the US, nominally, the antenna that's used by many of the KA operators is about a 0.7 meter antenna. But perhaps in a very high rain area like Florida, uh, these operators will use a 1 meter or maybe a 1.2 meter antenna. So we can, we can overcome quite a bit of rain fade just by simply going to a slightly larger antenna in combination with these other techniques as well. The result is that uh, the satellite operators are able to provide services that are about 99.7% availability, which is quite good. And so we can overcome this issue of rain fade with KA band.